Welcome to the last module for financial institutions and management. In this module, we cover um, a lot of uh, other financial institutions besides banks. This includes savings, savings and loans or savings institutions. Um, sometimes they're called thrifts, credit unions, finance companies, investment companies, or mutual fund firms, and securities firms or brokerage firms. Um, this is intended to be a very brief highlight of these other institutions. I want to emphasize that you need to study the textbook for uh, the definitions and the detailed operation of this individual of all these different types of institutions. Um, there are important details in there. In this lecture, what I hope to do is to highlight the differences and the similarities. So I'm not going into the specific details. So you need to read the textbook for those details. Uh, but what I want to do is to draw a large picture. Take, in, in other words, take a step back and, say, and, and look at all the different institutions that we have studied. We have studied banks, which was the focus. And then how are these other institutions different or similar or, or are similar to banks? Savings institutions are actually very, very similar to banks. They are thrifts and they have served a very important function. One thing that is distinct or unique about saving institution in contrast to bank is that some savings institutions are called mutual. So, and they'll have the name mutual in, uh, they'll have the word mutual in their name. Uh, banks, by definitions, are all stock owned, uh, meaning that the banks are, construct, uh, con are in, constructed as a corporation. Uh, some banks start off as partnership, but almost all banks nowadays are corporations. So, what distinguish in savings institutions um, or savings and loan or thrifts is that some of them are considered mutuals and in the mutual ownership the institution is owned by the depositors so what makes that unique is then the interest that is earned by the depositors is actually a function of the profitability of the institution so when you join a savings and loan or savings institution that is a mutual uh, ownership structure, you, the depositor, automatically becomes part owner of the institution. Uh, so because of that, they tend to be smaller than commercial bank and most of them are, are regional or very local. Um, as you say, as you see, since the depositors are also owners, they form a much stronger community and they have a say in the operation of the savings institutions by the ability to elect board of directors. The main source of fund, meaning the liability of the savings institutions are deposits, and the main use of funds are mortgages and commercial loans to small business and, loan, and uh, property loans and business operation loans. Many savings institutions have lately merged with commercial banks over the years, and some of them are not as small anymore. So they may start as a small local firm, um, but through mergers and acquisitions, they have become um, much bigger over time. Um, this is particularly was true since the um, 2000s where some savings institutions was very aggressive in pursuing and expanding their their strategy uh, their business strategy to expand um, across geographic location and also across industries the financial crisis and savings institutions um, have gone hand in hand for many many years uh, in fact because most uh, savings institutions and savings and loans invest very heavily in mortgages and back in the 70s they were very local and regional they were subject to um, much higher default risk than other types of financial institutions they have gone through several financial crises. Back in the 1980s, um, after the regulations allow savings institutions to make much more risky loans and investments, um, those change in the regulation led to higher risk loans um, given by financial uh, savings and savings and loans and institutions. And also in the 1980s, short-term interest rate increased dramatically in order to fight inflation of the late 1970s. Um, this 
there were a lot of losses and bankruptcies among savings and loans. So the industry suffered heavily during that time. And as in any any case, um, whenever there is deregulation, um, you will see um, cases of frauds. This, um, unfortunately, um, since the 1980s, um, deregulation continues and savings and loans once they have emerged from their last losses, they re-engage in the same um, lending because that is their primary business. The primary business of savings institutions is mortgage lending. So once again in, the in 2008, when the financial crisis um, centered around mortgage defaults, savings institutions um, were one of the major um, victims of the financial crisis. Now, they were also part of the participant, but they also bear a lot of the um, the, the, the bad outcomes. Um, so when they, I say they are victims, they actually were also a heavy participant because they, um, they led the wave in subprime loans and also um, mortgage loans that requires no documentation. They're called no doc loans and they led to um, a lot of mortgage defaults and the loans that, um, and of course that led to heavy losses by financial institutions. So some of the most famous or notable failures um, include Countrywide Mortgage, Countrywide Financial. Um, they were one of the largest mortgage underwriters in America back in the 2000s. Um, eventually, they were acquired by Bank of America. Um, um, they were literally in bankruptcy when Bank of America acquired them. IndyMac. Um, is another large savings institution and it has a portfolio of $32 billion in loan and it lost um, most of it during the financial crisis. Washington Mutual, notice that the name Mutual is, in, in, is uh, the name Washington Mutual includes the word Mutual. That means the depositor is part owner of this firm, but Wamu is one of the largest depositor institutions. Um, Back in the 2000s, they pursued a very aggressive expansionary policy and eventually they failed in 2008. And their failure, um, the, the, the notoriety then becomes that they uh, be, become the largest depository institution ever to fail. So savings and loans has a long history with financial crisis, primarily because they invest heavily in mortgages and and when um, during housing bubbles of the 70s and the housing bubble of 2000 in the 2000s, in both cases, savings and loans suffer greatly when mortgage defaults. Another type of institutions that are very similar to banks and savings institutions are credit unions. Credit unions is organized as a nonprofit. So, and they, and they need to have a common theme. Uh, this common theme is not very strict. So uh, you can have a credit union that is based on a belief. So you can have a church, for example, the Lutheran credit union. Um, you can be affiliated with a uni university or uh, a local area. So the important, uh, how can you tell something is a credit union is in the name. The name of the institution has to have the, term, the words credit union in it. Um, for a lot of consumer, um, it is difficult to distinguish between a bank, a savings institution, or a credit union um, because all of them accept deposits and all of them allow um, consumers to take out loans. Um, it is important because of how they are regulated and how investors are, uh, uh, how your deposits are being treated. So in a credit union uh, is because it's a nonprofit, it is technically owned by all the depositors. So very similar to a mutual, uh, a mutually owned financial uh, savings institutions. For credit union, similar to savings institution, they can have a federal charter or a state charter. If it's a federal charter, just like banks as well, then it's regulated by a federal bank examiner. If it's a state charter, you'll be regulated by the state uh, agency. The advantage of being a credit union is that because it is, it is a nonprofit, it is not taxable. Um, and 
Now, this is the tax exam status extend only to the credit union itself. The interest income that is earned by a depositor from a credit union is still taxable, but the credit union itself, there's no income because it's a nonprofit. And most importantly, a credit union, the non-interest expense is typically relatively low because the office and furniture are often do donated or that they, if you go to a credit union, is typically a no thrill um, operation. So they, they, they are really, in their purpose is to serve the members. Um, particularly, they're typically small and the disadvantage of being small is that it's difficult for them to attract um, highly qualified professionals. So they suffer similar um, issues that face other um, nonprofits. So they tend to be small and it's difficult to get um, good people to run these operations. So credit unions, unlike savings institutions and banks, is insured by a different organization. So 90% of the credit unions are insured by the National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund. So not FDIC. Notice that credit unions are not banks and they are not deposit institutions. So they are not insured by FDIC. Um, Credit union typically pay an annual insurance premium. So similar to banks, they have to pay a, a insurance premium to FDIC. Um, and in case of default, the NCU will then um, reimburse the depositors of a credit union. So for federal credit unions, they are regulated by the Federal Credit Union Administration. Um, and for state charter, they have um, their each state has their own agencies. So the examiners typically classify credit unions into either low risk or go one, two, three, four, five to high risk. So depositors can look into um, the rankings of their credit unions before you choose one. Um, so credit unions, they are still significant. They're small in size. So typically they do not, um, they do not bear um, or have too much impact on systematic risk to the economy as a whole. Um, depositors still need to pay attention to the risk of their relative credit unions. The next type of finance institutions are uh, finance companies. So what distinguishes finance companies from banks, savings institutions, and credit unions is that finance companies do not take deposits. So we are moving further and further away from bank. If you look at bank as our primary form of financial intermediaries, then uh, savings institution is still very similar, uh, but they have different forms of ownership. Um, and then credit unions are again very similar, but they're much smaller and they are regulated by different agencies. Finance companies is uh, further distinguished from banks in that their primary purpose is to make loans, but they chant their source of fund, meaning where they get their money from to make loans is typically not deposits. So in order for them to, so finance companies typically feel a niche that banks and savings institutions and credit unions do not, um, are not able to fulfill. Um, they are the largest provider of financing to consumers for retails. So stock credit cards, so if you take a Macy's credit card or a, um, um, Coast credit card, those credit card which you can you can only use to make purchases in the respective stores. Um, those those cards are typically um, provided by a finance company. They are also very uh, heavily involved in car loans. So finance companies they range um, from a traditional finance company like GMAC, which um, is one of the largest car loan providers um, in the nation um, to um, 
more questionable finance companies that um, participate in the buy uh, pay here buy here um, type of um, used car loans. So that's another very important market segment for finance companies. Uh, they also uh, some of them also provide real estate loans. Uh, for so one important thing that uh, important characteristic of finance company is that they seldom deal with the borrowers directly. So if you take out a loan from a bank, for example, you'll walk into a bank, and you'll take out a loan, a private loan. With finance company, you seldom deal with them directly, and you may or may not recognize their name. So, if you want to purchase, um, say, a um, a set of curtains from um, Macy's or ma buy a mattress from Macy's, you will go to Macy's and you will sign up for a Macy's credit card. You are working with a Macy's employer and uh, employee, and you will take out a credit card in um, that you deal. You thought you were dealing with Macy's, but actually you are signing a contract with a finance company that provides the loan, the funds through Macy's. The same thing for taking a car loan. You go to a car store, an automobile store to buy a car. And at the time when you're ready to buy the car, you sign the paper for a car loan. You're working with the car dealers, even though the money comes from a finance company. Uh, similarly, to for real estate loans, you you will go to a mortgage broker. Uh, when you are buying a house, you find the house. Your your real estate broker will introduce you to a mortgage broker, and you work with the mortgage broker to find a loan. The loan that the mortgage broker sells you is comes from a finance company, but you never work with the finance company directly. You're always working through. Um, and retail establishment. So a finance company, you can think of them as the backs. The back office or the or the backside of a of a retail um, institution. They also work with business directly. This is a big part of finance companies. They do business loans and leasing. So you can see a similarity in there again with business leasing. A business will walk in, will get an equipment through an equipment store, and the financing will be done through a finance company. For business loan, they seldom do direct loans, but what they typically do is either inventory loans, um, accounts receivable loans, and also um, particularly in um, credit card processing. So instead of um, receiving a, when a business open a credit card, they are actually um, getting a loan from a finance company, and the and then when the credit card company pays receive payment from their credit credit card holder, then the credit card company pays off the finance companies. So that's um, again those are the back office. You as a consumer, you will seldom see a finance company, um, or you will seldom interact with a finance company directly. So since finance company typically operates in the background, they don't take deposits. Their primary source of fund is loans from banks or by issuing their own commercial paper and bonds. That's really the major source of financing. So finance companies are very highly leveraged. They issue a lot of finance, commercial papers and bonds. Um, so in, when we talk about liquidity, finance company is really critical. Um, Short-term liquidity is critical for their survival. Another type of financial intermediaries is mutual funds. These are also called investment companies. So here we definitely take a further step away from banks, but mutual funds and investment companies actually operate in a um, serve the same similar purpose in a financial intermediary standpoint. They bring um, different parties that have different financial needs together and they act as the intermediary. So each mutual, once something very interesting about mutual fund operation, um, each mutual fund is a separate legal entity. And then the management company or the holding company, this, are, this is called the investment company. And these companies manage many mutual funds. So if you buy one mutual fund, for example, if you buy the Vanguard Market Index Fund, you are actually a shareholder of that mutual fund alone. Um, 
the reason why it's set up that way is so that the ups and downs of any one mutual fund does not affect the the um the results on another mutual fund so the investment company is the holding company the mutual fund itself is a separate legal entity it has a, and it also has an important characteristic because mutual funds is recognized by the irs as a pass-through typed um, operation the income on a mutual fund is not taxed so when you buy shares in a mutual fund you only your income through the fund is taxed. The mutual fund itself doesn't have to pay tax. Now the investment company, on the other hand, Vanguard for example, by itself is a company and that company has to pay federal income tax if it makes income. But not the return on the stocks that the individual mutual fund earns. So this is an important um, distinction. So the sources of fund for mutual funds is, these are actually considered equity. So when you buy a share of a mutual fund, you become a shareholder, an investor, and you own equity of that mutual fund. Um, so the, so it's bringing investors together, and the purpose of the fund is to purchase stocks or bonds. So the primary source of fund is from individual investors contributing, and the use of fund is primarily to purchase financial securities. Uh, there are different types of mutual funds, and they can purchase things in addition to traditional financial securities, such as stocks and bonds. Um, we'll talk about those in, in a little bit. Um, an investor purchasing in a mutual fund generate return in three forms. One is your traditional interest or dividend from the bonds and stocks that they invested. And also if the fund manager decided to sell a stock or bond, they will, exp they will then realize capital gain or capital loss. Uh, lastly, if an investor decides to sell the mutual fund, then the, the uh, fund's value, they are called net asset value, the value of the fund could have gone up or down from the day they purchased. So as an investor, while you're holding the fund, you earn interest income and capital gain due to trading by the mutual fund manager. The, as an investor, when you decide to sell the mutual fund, the change in net asset value of the mutual fund is also part of your return. So, in a, so in, compared to buying a stock directly, where you have dividends and capital gain, when you buy a mutual fund, you have dividend and capital gain due to portfolio turnover by the fund manager. You, are, you also have a second um, capital gain, which is the change in the net asset value of the fund that you purchase. Something very important when choosing mutual fund is looking at the expenses. Um, studies after studies um, have shown that the expense represents make a bigger impact on the overall return than the uh, management skill of the individual um, investment manager. The um, low fund, low fees. This low fee is a, a form of commission. This is a percentage. It can range anywhere from one to five percent um, of your investment. So you pay this on um, on the day you purchase the fund. Those are called front end loaded. There are also back low fee. Those are fees that those are percentage that you pay if you sell the fund. Some funds has a graduated back end low that. Um, they are higher in in the first few years and then eventually goes away um, as your length of ownership increases. And those, the back end lows oftentimes are, are there to discourage investors from turning over the portfolio too often. There are a lot of funds that are no low. For example, Fidelity, uh, I mean, Vanguard is very famous for its no low fund. So it does not pay commission for the stockbroker to sell you the fund. And then another one is called 12B1 fee. This is this is particularly important because 12B1 fee is not a one-time fee. It's a recurring fee every single year. Um, and it's specifically ta uh, targeted for marketing and sales. So 12B1 fee um, doesn't really affect the performance of your fund. It is in, imposed in there by the fund company to help them sell the funds to other investors. And then the more typical are the advisor fees and management fees. You can expect index funds to have a much lower advisor fee and management fee compa uh, fees compared to uh, actively managed funds.
One area where mutual fund competes with other financial institutions is money market funds. Money market funds typically invest in very, very low risk, and they offer a very attractive return compared to savings accounts and banks. Um, so, in fact, you see many banks also sell money market funds um, as an alternative to investors. Um, so, when we compare um, the functions of mutual funds, money market funds is really the only area where uh, the mutual fund company interacts and competes with other financial institutions. So now let's take a look at um, all different types of financial intermediation that facilitate um, investment in equity. So banks typically don't invest in equity. Banks typically take deposits from say, some investors and then they give loans out to investors. Um, the following financial institutions take um, contributions from individual investors and then they use the contribution to invest in equity. The first and most common type is open-ended mutual funds. This is what people typically think of when you think of mutual funds. Uh, for open-ended mutual funds, um, investors can buy shares directly from the investment companies and their, the price is called the net asset value. The net asset value for open-ended mutual funds are computed once a day at the end of the day. So if you place an order, for example, to buy a fund at 10 o'clock in the morning, that transaction will get processed at the end of the day, um, will get processed at the most recent trading day's uh, uh, price. Closed-end mutual funds, in this case, the shares can be purchased from the investment company when those funds are newly formed. Once the funds are formed, they closed. So closed end here means that no new investment can go directly into the investment companies. So when the shares, when the fund was first created, investors can buy shares directly from the company. But once that is closed, once the fund closes, then they can only buy shares through a broker. In fact, they can only buy shares from other investors. So if you buy a closed-end mutual fund and you need your money back, you do not go get your money back from the investment company, but instead you have to sell your shares to another investor like a stock through a broker. So closed-end mutual fund it operates a little bit more like a stock. Like a stock. Um, in the initial offering process, you, the money goes directly from the investors to the fund, man, to the fund company, but once the offering is done, then transactions occur between investors through brokers. Exchange traded funds is much more similar to closed end fund, except that they are um, they the shares are traded on stock exchanges, and the price for these shares are um, changes continuously throughout the day. So. Um, in terms of pricing, you can get a more recent pricing for exchange traded funds. This is, is, is a lot more like a stock. Hedge funds are subject to very different regulations than open-ended mutual funds. Um, the reason for that is because the investment in hedge funds are restricted to accredited investors, and the SEC defines what an accredited investor is is. Uh, it's typically based on net wealth, um, their net worth, meaning how much, uh, how wealthy they are, what is their total asset, and also their income. Um, the idea is that only accredited investors that can afford to tolerate the risk is allowed to invest in hedge funds. Um, and because of that, hedge funds have much lower reporting requirement and they, have, they are subject to much fewer regulations and they are able to um, invest in much higher risk investments. And typically a hedge fund has a very high initial investment and withdrawal and, and restriction on withdrawal from the investments. So it, because hedge funds are highly, reg, are highly um, individualized and not regulated, you really need to read the perspective carefully if you want to buy a hedge funds to know what that fund specializes in. Each hedge fund is different, each hedge fund is unique. Unlike open-ended mutual funds, these are highly regulated funds. They have to follow 
the SEC rules on investment companies. Um, in return, they gain a, a special tax treatment, and also they are allowed to sell stocks uh, or shares um, of the mutual funds directly to individual investors. So you can you can open a mutual fund account for as little as $100, $500. So from and, not, and you can and from open ended mutual funds, if you want your money back, you can use very liquid. You can redeem it by the next trading day. Um, and for hedge funds, they oftentimes have restrictions on redemption. So once you invest in the hedge funds, you may if you need your money back, you may not be able to. Something that's very closely related to hedge fund is venture capital fund or private equity fund. So again, these are typically restricted to um, accredited investors and they invest primarily in private companies. So a hedge fund can invest in a public company, but they can pursue very specialized trading strategies, um, especially computerized trading algorithms. Um, venture capital fund and private equity funds specialize in private company, companies that has, non, has not gone public. Uh, Venture capital funds typically specialize in new startup companies um, and private equity funds tend to specialize in turnaround. These are companies that are in distress and the private equity fund will either buy them, turn them around or uh, typically involve cost cutting and layoff um, or mergers. The last type of financial institutions that we'll look at are securities firms or brokerage firms. Um, these are investment banking companies. They provide um, a variety of services. So we'll focus on the service side. So they are a form of financial intermediary because they help businesses that need money raise funds. And this is a large part of their, um, their business. So those are called investment banking. Investment banking is to help businesses raise money that they need. Um, underwriting is, is the um, primary uh, business function of securities firms or where they generate most of their revenue. Um, so underwriting typically uh, focus on either stocks or bonds. Uh, stock offering, the um, most difficult one is IPO, initial public offering. Um, this is when a company sells stocks to the general public for the first time is very expensive and time consuming, but translation for a securities firm is consuming is time consuming and expensive for the company, which also means uh, provides a lot of revenue for the securities firm. Um, in addition to taking comp company public for the first time, uh, they also continue to offer equity whenever a company needs funds. So this will be the season public offering or anytime a company needs to raise money. In addition to selling equity to the general public, securities firms also help with private equity placement. So as venture capital and as private equity becomes more and more important, um, securities firms often does the, the bookkeeping and the back office work for venture capital firms. So if a business is looking for a venture capital firm, sometimes they'll actually go through an investment banking firm to find a venture capital investment. As far as the public offering, whether it's initial public offering or season equity offering, um, the primary role of the securities firm is to set the offer price and they will form a syndicate. A syndicate is a group of investment banks um, to help distribute the shares because they need to find enough investors to buy the shares that the company is selling. So in addition to stocks, Security firms also sell bonds to the, to the general public. And these bonds can come from private companies or municipalities. So even universities and states, when they issue bonds, they will also go through an investment banking firm. Um, the only government uh, organization that does not is the federal government. So if you buy, you're buying treasury bonds, you buy it directly from the treasurer. Uh, the Treasury Department. Other than the Treasury Department, most of the other agencies, they will issue their bonds, they will still use an investment bank. So the primary role is in setting the terms, and that includes the coupon rate on the bond, the maturity, the call provision, and the, any other provisions. So sinking fund provisions, um, collaterals, um, 
if he is uh, is a floating rate, the floating rate provisions, um, and any um, covenants um, that either restricts or limit the companies um, uh, what the company can and cannot do. All those terms has to be included in in the bond offering. Um, just like stock offering, it's important for them to form a syndicate to help them distrib distribute the bonds. Um, bonds can, again, be a public offering, um, like stocks, or it can be a private placement. Uh, private placements are much more common with bonds. Um, this investment bankers will set the terms, and they'll form a syndicate, and the syndicate could then go into private placement and distribute the bonds to the primary clients, which includes mutual uh, pension plans, um, and also insurance companies. More recently, a larger and larger portion of the revenue for securities firms come from securitization. Securitization is um, creating derivative securities that are based on other financial securities. A famous one is mortgage-backed securities, where bonds are created based on mortgages, which are loans that banks have um, are mortgage loans. So some of there are also other types of um, securitization, um, and these are based on other types of asset. And this can be any other loans. This can be auto loans. Um, this can be credit loans, credit card loans, meaning uh, they can also be student loans. Another uh, function that the securities firm perform is in mergers and acquisitions. They can be on either side of the transaction. Uh, they can be the company who is looking to acquire someone else, and they can, or they can also be at the side, uh, helping the company who is the target of, a, of an acquisition on uh, negotiating terms or try to defend themselves from being acquired. So they, in this type of transactions, they get advising fees and as long with legal and transaction fees. Um, in addition to helping the companies that are successful, they also help companies who may need, uh, who are not doing well and need restructuring. And restructuring oftentimes means um, easing equity to replace debt because um, most of the time when companies are in financial distress, they can't afford their, uh, to pay off their loan. So in restructuring, they also will um, help negotiate terms with the current debt, uh, creditors and and thereby be able to um, help the company avoid bankruptcy. So this is the side of the investment banking firm that work with businesses and organizations. Uh, the other side of the investment banking firm is to work with individual investors. This is the brokerage service. Um, and the, the most um, important part or the, from the perspective of the brokerage firm, the, the highest revenue generating service is money management. In money management, the broker uh, actively manage the investments for the client. So they decide what stocks to buy, what bonds to buy. They will have to get authorization from the client, but they will make the recommendation and, and, and perform the trade on behalf of the client. Uh, sometimes the client will actually give authorization and allow the, the broker to, um, to, do, to do those transactions on their behalf without their, without their, um, their active involvement. Uh, management fees for, uh, for those services are typically much higher uh, than other types of um, investment uh, brokerage services. Uh, trading. Um, is another major service that um, investment banking firms provide. They, from trading, the fees they earn are through trading commission. Uh, some brokerage firms are considered full service broker and others are considered discount brokers. Full service broker provide um, advice. Um, these are they're not fee-based advice, but rather they are free advice, quote, free advice, but they charge a higher commission. A discount broker only execute trades and doesn't provide advice and they typically charge a lower commission. Uh, in, that, in addition to charging commissions, if an investor trade on uh, margin uh, or short sales, then the investment, the, bank, uh, the broker also uh, earn interest on the margin accounts. 
So those are the two main surface underwriting and brokerage service. In addition to that, some securities firms also conduct proprietary trading. Proprietary, tra proprietary trading is when a brokerage firm, an investment banking firm, uh, buys and sells stocks on behalf of the firm itself. And oftentimes that they that take on risk. Um, because they have access to a lot of capital through the investment banking and bookish uh, service, um, they oftentimes can take on a lot of leverage in the proprietary trading. And that has led to, um, uh, this is somewhat controversial. Some securities firms do not participate in proprietary trading. Uh, some of them uh, participate limited uh, among of proprietary trading, uh, primarily to facilitate um, a transaction. So, for example, if a a bookish firm, uh, an investment banking firm, is trying to um, issue stock for, say, an IPO for a new company, and they could not find enough um, investors to buy the shares, the investment banking firm may buy those shares themselves. When they do that, they're engaging in proprietary trading. So that's one one way, and then there are firms who actively participate in proprietary trading, um, independent of the investment banking services and the brokerage services. So all these firms are subject to different types of regulations. Um, the the SEC, the Security Exchange Commission, is the uh, primary. Um, regulatory agency on underwriting. Um, they put this, most of this has to do with, uh, most of these regulations relates to the company who are selling the stock rather than the brokerage firm. So the company has to register with the SEC. They have to, uh, once you become a public company, you have to follow this disclosure requirement, meaning that when you disclose information to the public, you have to dis disseminate that information equally and all simultaneously to all investors. Um, they have filing requirements with um, these are the 10Ks and 10Qs. These are the financial statement filing requirement and any major uh, material information. Uh, regulation FD, FD stands for fair disclosure. That has to do with um, what, uh, when a disclosure requirement is an earlier regulation, it regulates what information needs to be disclosed. Regulation SD, FD says that those information must be disclosed in a timely manner simultaneously to all participants. Um, what analysts can say and who gets information first uh, is regulated by the analyst rating. So all those are regulated by the SEC. In addition to SEC rules, um, each individual stock exchange, if these are private companies, they have their own rules as well, and they differ from exchanges to exchanges. So I encourage you to go to New York Stock Exchange, NYSE, and, and look at their regulation versus NASDAQ. Uh, lastly, there is an agent, uh, there's a private, again, this is a private corporation called S. P SIPC. SIPC offers insurance on the cash and securities that are deposited at brokerage firms. So for example, um, if I have a brokerage account with um, Vingar or I have a brokerage account with um, Goldman Sachs, um, the stocks I own actually resize with Goldman Sachs. Um, today, these are all computer records. Um, if Goldman Sachs goes bankrupt and they have been using my stock, um, I, I am protected up to $500,000 um, of all my investment that are with Goldman Sachs. So, so this is similar in spirit to the FDIC insurance for banks, but SIPC applies to brokerage firms. The 2008 financial crisis has tremendous impact on securities firms. Um, the reason was that they were very, very much involved in the securitization process, and they also engaged in a lot of proprietary trading. And um, during this financial crisis, they faced severe liquidity problem. And in order to solve their liquidity problem, they need to borrow money from the Federal Reserve. Now, however, the Federal Reserve is only available to banks not to securities firm. That was the rule that was set down way back in the 1930s to avoid investment banking firms, failure of investment banking firms, 
bringing down the entire economy. As you can see, we are back to square one in 2008. Um, so, they basically, the government basically decided that the security firms are too big to fail and they allowed them to become bank holding companies overnight. And once they are bank holding companies, then they can borrow funds from the Federal Reserve. But by becoming bank holding companies, they are also then now subject to banking regulations, not just SEC regulations. So that is the immediate impact of the financial crisis. Um, this has become household names, the, the major failures in 2008. Um, Lehman Brothers was the first one. Um, they actually went bankrupt. And then Merrill Lynch was bought out by Bank of America. They, it, so Merrill Lynch also no longer exists. Uh, Bear Stern um, was also close to failure, but they were bailed out by the U.S. government. They were bailed by the U.S. government indirectly through a loan. The last group of, um, of the second to last group uh, of company that we look at are uh, insurance companies. Insurance companies are a, are a very different form of financial intermediaries. So in here, they are more focused on sharing risk rather than um, the transfer of funds. Um, there are different types of insurance, life insurance company, property and casualty insurance, and health insurance. We will just give a brief overview of these this different types of insurance. The primary source of fund money, that, and, and there are some business insurance as well. The primary source of fund is through insurance premiums. So insurance company collects premiums from um, insurers, from their customers, and then um, they use those money and they'll invest those money. So the two major sources of fund is insurance premiums and the return they earn from investing those premiums. Their primary use of fund is to in, invest in financial assets so they can earn return and also to make ins to pay out insurance claims. So any money that uh, so they will have uh, premium and return and they use those to pay out claims. And if they have excess, they will use the excess money to invest. One thing that's distinctive about the insurance company is that insurance company, there are no national insurance companies. So insurance companies, each one of them are a separate corporation in each state. So you may have heard of an insurance company such as uh, Liberty Mutual or um, State Farm or Blue Cross Blue Shield, they are they are companies, but they each one are separately incorporated in state. So each company in a state is its own entity, and they are regulated by the agencies in each state. So so um, there's no again there's no national insurance agencies. There's only state insurance agencies, which makes it very challenging because. Um, the state rules are, differ from state to state. Um, there is an association called the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. They try to facilitate um, companies that operate in multiple states so that they have more similar regulations. Their primary job for the state agency is to assess the risk of the insurance companies. So the tools are relatively basic. They focus on financial ratios. Uh, the financial ratios can focus on the value of the investment that the insurance company hold, the return on investments, the relative size of the company's operating budget, and the liquidity of the portfolio. So as you can see, these are the market value versus book value, return on investment, these are expense ratios, and then liquidity um, of this portfolio. So this can be measurement of um, durations as well as the market size of the um, asset holdings. So the most important question for an insurance agency is, will the company, will the insurance company be able to absorb losses or decline in the marketplace? So 
obviously this is um, this is what did not happen um, in the 2008 financial crisis. The the insurance company GIC was a company that was issuing credit default swaps. Credit default swaps are basically insurance contracts, and they were not able to absorb the losses when the market declined. So insurance company plays an actually really important role during the 2008 financial crisis. We'll talk about that a lot more in a minute. Uh, so based on the assessment of risk, the insurance agency determined how much capital the insurance company has to have. Um, so they have to report um, risk-based capital ratio to um, the regulator. So it's not just capital, they also have to look, to look at what those ca capital here means equity. So how risky are those capital? If, um, so capital is equity and asset. So if they're investing in junk bonds, that's a much higher risk than if they're invested in government bonds. So the, the model or the formula that they use to determine the risk base, what is risk base is developed by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. So there is one single formula across the entire United States that insurance company can use to determine their risk base capital. So the ownership structure of insurance company is also uh, similar to savings institutions. They can be mutual ownerships. So this will be own, uh, companies that, that are owned by its policyholders. So for example, Liberty Mutual, the name mutual is in, in the word mutual is in the name and therefore it has a mutual ownership. Uh, so what is interesting if you are with a um, mutual ownership insurance company is that your insurance premium can sometimes be affected by the return on investment by these companies. So your premium, remember the cash flow for um, insurance company, your premium is based on the payout that the company make to people who file claims, as well as return on investment. So, uh, oh, and it's offset by return on investment. So if the company generate a lot of return, it can actually lower the insurance premiums for its policyholders. Uh, contrary to stock own, uh, these are companies that are owned by shareholders. And its premium is set based on comp competition in the marketplace. So the four major types of insurance are life insurance. Life insurance is probably one of the oldest insurance types of insurance. Um, you need to know the different types of policy. I won't go into them. They're called whole life, term life, universal, and they're also new hybrid type policy. Um, and I want to focus on the management of this company. So typical portfolio for life ins insurance companies are bonds because life insurance are much longer term. So the, the policy pay out when the policy holder dies. So typically the, the holder's life expectancy is relatively long um, and therefore they want longer term investments. So corporate bonds and stocks um, mortgage-backed securities and mortgages um, and government bonds. These are the major types of investments for um, that life insurance companies make. So they collect premiums and they invest in these um, assets and they pay out the policy um, when claims are filed. The primary method for managing risk for life insurance companies is to estimate what the expected payouts are. And for life insurance companies, those statistics are relatively well known and they are fairly predictable. So the payout for life insurance companies, uh, com life insurance companies know quite well what the expected payout is in each year. Um, so for a, a conservative life insurance company, they will, pop, they will try to use duration matching, what we talk about in banks, as a tool to minimize risk. Property and casualty insurance um, uh, uh, applies to personal properties. This can be cars, house, um, your jewelry, um, and also liabilities. This is if someone falls on your driveway or you hit someone with your car, um, those are liabilities and that's under property and casualty insurance. Um, because these are very short term. The policies often last one year or less. Um, you can get, if you, for example, if you buy a new car, you cancel your last policy and you get a new one. So the turnover is relatively high. Um, and as I said, they cover a very, a very diverse type of activity. So the payout is a little bit harder to forecast. 
um, and particularly um, they can be related to natural disasters. So house and car insurance, think about a hurricane um, that can severely increase the payout in one year, and then you can have two or three years that go by that have no hurricanes. So because the payout is a lot harder to predict, casualty insurance typically invests in lower risk asset compared to life insurance companies. Um, so it, they would typically have a much smaller percentage in stocks and much have larger percentage in government bonds. Healthcare insurance depends on the type of healthcare plans. Um, so again, you need to read up on what's the difference between a managed healthcare plan uh, versus um, a, a, um, an open or uh, open selection healthcare plan. Uh, indemnity plan is the name. Uh, so you have to, so the difference between a managed healthcare plan and an indemnity plan is that an indemnity plan allow you to choose any provider that you want. Um, the premiums depends on which type of plan you choose. Um, other factors that affect the premium besides managed versus indemnity is deductibles and lifetime and and also. Um, um, a deductible per calendar year, per operations, and also co-payments. Uh, how much do you pay per visit? Insurance companies are regulated by state agencies. So right now there's no national insurance companies. Um, however, there are federal government regulations. Um, at this point, the Affectable Care Act that was passed in 2010 is being challenged. And um, there are significant proposed changes going on right now um, in, um, in Congress. We don't know what those changes will be yet. They have not been finalized. So um, is, I, you need to look, you need to study up on what the current rules are under the Affectable Affordable Care Act and also what some of those proposed changes will, will do um, if they get implemented. The last type of financial institution we'll touch on are pension plans. Pension plans are primarily for retirement. Uh, there are two major types. One is public pension plans. The biggest federal pension plan is Social Security. Uh, that covers basically almost everyone that lives in the United States. Um, and there are also federal pension plans for federal employees. And then there are also state and local uh, pension plans. Again, most of those are for, to cover state employees. The public pension plans are, funds are typically pay as you go. Pay as you go meaning that um, those of us who are working today pay our tax, our contribution to these funds, and then people who have retired will get receive payment from these funds. So, and the funds are commingled, meaning that what I pay today is not tied to my individual benefit, but rather it goes into this pool. And the Liquidity of this public pension fund depends on people continue to pay because this is pay as you go uh, system. Private pension plans are different. Private pension plans are typically given offered by companies, and the main uh, main characteristics of uh, distinguishes private pension plans are whether they are defined benefit versus defined contribution. In a defined benefits plan, the company or the organization um, takes the risk because they are guaranteeing the benefit that an individual will receive in retirement. In defined contribution, the individual takes on the risk. The companies and organization contributes among uh, money to the plan today, and the individual is responsible for investing those contributions. And however those contributions, those return um, pays out in the future, the individual takes the risk. Regulations on pension plans compared to other institutions are federal. So there's really no state, um, there's no state regulations on pension plans, but there are government regulations on pension plan. ERISA um, is, was first introduced in 1974 and again revised in significantly in 1989. Um, again, uh, the reason why it was created was because when company go through a round of bankruptcy during the 1970s, um, they was found that their pension plan, uh, those companies has, um, has um, 
has t actually taken money out of pension plans and therefore their employees, not just do they lose their job, they also lose all their retirement benefits. So ERISA was introduced to avoid that from happening again because the pensions were legally um, the property of the employees and not the companies. Um, so they, they created the Pension Benefits Guarantee Corporation, which um, again provides an insurance system. So companies are required to pay insurance premium, and if a company defaults, um, who are part of um, the Guarantee Corporation, then the, corporate, the insurance will pay um, the employees on behalf of the company. Uh, in 2006, um, they pass a Pension Protection Act, and they require companies that are currently underfunding their pension plans to uh, to fulfill the obligation within seven years. So again, this the pensions are not property of the firm; they are properties of employees. So this this is a case where the government, but the employees is hard for the, to the employee to enforce this. Uh, unlike a bank, they cannot force a company to go into bankruptcy if they don't pay up. So the government has to step in and provide that um, um, the enforcement. So for companies who are funding um, pension funds, they have to typically apply one of two strategy. One is match funding, meaning that they put money in that matches the cash outflow. Uh, the other is projected funding, meaning they expect they look into the value of the pension and they and they match the, the value of the pension with um, the same amount of investments. Um, Lastly, I want to quickly over, over um, provide a review um, of the Dot Frank um, Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. This was introduced in um, 2010. So again, um, this this is a very comprehensive act, and it covers many many areas of financial services. These are just uh, some of the highlights. Um, so I'm going to simply ask you to go over them. <laughs> So I will not read the details, but I want to highlight the, um, the, the main points of the act and how it relates to the financial crisis. Because of the um, moral hazard situation, it introduced um, the act um, focuses on mortgage origination. So it, 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 um, it basically tells financial companies that even if you can sell off the loan, you cannot pass off that uh, responsibility for vetting mortgage uh, borrowers. So the, here they say the, the, the act requires comp uh, financial companies, mortgage companies and banks to actually look at the ability of the borrower to pay back the loan. Um, again, this would not have been necessary if there is no moral hazard. Uh, so if the bank were required if the banks were holding on to the mortgage, meaning that they were the one who will be receiving future payments, they definitely will pay a lot of attention. You would not want to loan money to someone that you don't think they can pay it back. Uh, what happened here is when companies secure, when banks securitize or sell off those loans, that create moral hazard since they no longer rely on the on the on the borrowers to pay back their loan in the future they become less interested in making sure that they can pay back their loan. So the Consumer Protection Act focuses on the, the changes in the system and say, okay, we understand moral hazard, so we need a regulation to counter moral hazard. Um, it's very similar if you go through the rest of the regulation. Um, sale of mortgage-backed securities, it requires the financial institutions to keep 5% of the portfolio. So they are basically asking security firms to put their skin to have some skin in the game so that they're not creating MBS that are basically junk because they have to keep 5% of it. Um, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, this is in, designed to um, address the too big to fail systematic risk problem. So um, they, are, they look at financial stability in, in, in the economy and identify which firms um, uh, will become too big to fail if something does happen. So they do stress testing. Um, and then they also fit, uh, have regulations that says, if there is liquidity problem, if there is a financial crisis, 
what are the steps who is responsible for for doing um for doing what so that we don't get into a um a panic situation Um, the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is perhaps one of the most important part of the regulation because this uh, this bureau gave consumers a voice. So um, nowadays, if a um, so this streamlined the complaints that consumers have um, during the financial crisis, they unearthed that the situation where there were lots of consumer complaints, but because there are the regulatory um, structure is so confusing. Uh, some banks are regulated by the federal government, some banks are regulated by the state, and then the finance companies that are holding the loans are regulated yet by a third agency, and the insurance company who is supposed to pay off um, when mortgage borrowers defaults are regulated by state insurance agencies. That's just really, really complex for consumers. So they created a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is basically a one stop for consumer. So consumer that have complaints, um, they can go directly to the Protection Bureau. Uh, they are particularly use, uh, helpful in, uh, in helping consumers avoid um, illegal or semi-legal um, collection agency tactics. Um, derivatives was a major um, contributor to the financial crisis because the derivative securities, particularly swaps, are non-transparent. They're private contracts. So now they are required to be traded through a clearinghouse rather than over the counter. So this gives the government a, an abil the ability to know how many derivative securities are there in the economy. Um, in, before the financial crisis, because these securities are not traded centrally or ex, uh, through an exchange or clearing house, the government actually didn't know how many of these swaps and, and mortgage-backed securities existed, and they and therefore was not able to have a accurate measure of the level of systematic risk that were in ex, that were existing in the economy at that time. Uh, property trading, uh, this is famously known as the Volcker Rule, uh, it limits property trading by banks. So again, it is going back to the, to the time when um, we really needed to separate investment banking and property trading, which are much, much higher risk from the banks. So this was the, this was the lesson that was learned in the 1920s, but the regulation from the 1930s was basically uh, repealed throughout the uh, starting with the 1980s. Um, by the end of 2000, um, the Financial Modernization Act basically repealed most of the regulations that were put in place in the 1930s to uh, to separate proprietary trading and investment banking activities from banking from traditional commercial banking activities. Um, so basically, we forgot the lesson that we learned in the 1930s, and we had the financial crisis in 2008. And we said a lot of the proponents realized that the conditions that led to the 2008 financial crisis were the same conditions that led to the 1920 financial crisis. Uh, fortunately, we did not get into the depression that we had in the 1930s. Um, but if we do not reverse the regulation, we could very well have another financial crisis that could lead to a recession as severe as the one in the 1930s. And then lastly, um, obviously, it's, there was no insurance um, office at the federal level, which makes it very difficult to um, to regulate insurance companies that are that operate multi across state and com companies such as GIC um, that um, are underwriting insurance for national banks. So they created a federal insurance office um, that whose primary job is to monitor the insurance companies. So these are just the highlight of the of the Dodd Frank Act. And again, um, I highlight the area where it. Um, what are the primary causes of the financial crisis and how the act was um was designed to address those 
um, those shortcomings directly. And the financial crisis um, involved not just banks, it involves banks, investment banks, and insurance companies. So the financial service industry, each which each participant has a different role, but they all interact with each other. So this concludes the um, the over uh, a, a a general overview of all these other financial institutions and how they relate to each other.